Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Regional Services Committee meeting for Wednesday, October 2014th. And I would first of all like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. And I'm not seeing anybody else away. And so welcome everyone back from a busy month. And um, first of all, we'll start with the approval of the agenda. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Adoption of the minutes from September 26th. So moved, second. Any questions? All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Any business arising from the minutes? No business arising, Madam Chair. Thank you. We'll move on now to number four, public input period. The purpose of the public input period is written on the board there. It's 15 minutes and three minutes per person. Welcome. Madam Chair, I am Cliff Evans from Shawnigan Lake. Madam Chair, on today's agenda, uh, <coughs> there is a, the solid waste program and on there, I see a recommendation, recommended resolution to the best of the knowledge of the Board of Directors. There are no objections to the plan <coughs> that have not been acknowledged and addressed. First of all, I don't think the, the public has heard of these um, problems that need to be or sh have been acknowledged and addressed, what a, uh, objections were there and, and who have they been addressed with? The public certainly hasn't had a chance to have a go at, at this um, since the plan has been written and put out. We've had uh, uh, public meetings, but we have not had public meetings over this this 228 pages of gobbledygook. Uh, there is a, a dispute a resolution procedure, and uh, it's on page 184 of attachment A, a plan dispute resolution procedures. There have been disputes, but I've not heard any ne negotiations that take uh, that have taken place with the public. Otherwise, the public input needs negotiating. Madam Chair, many of the strategies outlined uh, would require the CVRD residents to ha change their behavior I take exception to this. Maybe the management needs to change their behavior and maybe it needs, the solid waste needs to be managed better. There's some actions of some people, not right, but I, I, I don't like to see language like this in a resolution. Then on guiding uh, principles, these are written by the government and they say um, they support practical and effective delivery of waste management services from the public and private service providers and level the, <coughs> and level the play, playing field with the region for private and public solid waste management facilities. Your three minutes is coming to an end. Okay. So there's other things that are not exactly true on the history of Shawnigan Lake uh, dump. I was uh, speaking with the um, I think there fire could be more speakers behind you. Your three minutes is up. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Come to the podium. Hi. I'm Doris Ogden and my family had a cabin on the lake, which Shawnigan Lake for years. Most of them were summer homes. We had like three outhouses on the property over the years. And as a little kid in 1955, my uh, uncle used to take me up to the garbage dump 
to dump the garbage, which if you come over the bridge, just before the bridge, coming from the west arm, right along the creek there in the bushes was the garbage dump in the 50s, and that's where everybody from the lake dumped their garbage. Now, that's right, it's all a treed area. There's nothing built on it. There's Wickham's Farm there, but that's an old garbage dump. And how much of that dump is leaking into thing, into the creek and going into the lake? So if they're worried about the lake, well, there's lots of issues from all the outhouses over the years and that garbage dump. I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. There was somebody else with their hand up. Hi, I'm Roz Cuthbert from uh, Shawnigan Lake. And for many, many years, uh, we have retired now, but our business relied solely on the support of Shawnigan Lake. It's a community where people in the schools have fundraisers to help their kids. It's a small community, but we get behind everything 100%. I think if we move away from our waste management that we have now that everyone seems super happy with that gives a service of above and beyond. It's the kind of service that you, you dream of in little communities. Our, our community is a paradise. We have, uh, we have garbage men that go and help old ladies drag it down the sidewalk. They are to, we would be putting people out of work. All of our, all of our support, our people, we employed many, many people over the years and it was Shawnigan that supported our company. And I feel that Shawnigan should be supporting other companies that are living and working and hiring people in Shawnigan. No one has any problem with the waste management we have now to shut down a, what we call ourselves a mom and pop operation. A mom and pop operation that gives 110% that has the heart of the community is extremely upsetting to us. To have it move off into the big sphere takes away from the heart of what Shawnigan is. Shawnigan is a community of people that care about each other, that put a lot of money into protecting against outside things like, like contaminated soils, all different things that happen. When people need help in the community, everyone gets behind it. I'm for supporting businesses that are created in the community they support the community, they employ the community. Little communities like Shawnigan will fast disappear in Canada if we stop supporting what is there. So I just want you to think about that. I'm sure CBRD and everything has great services, but Shawnigan is really happy with the way it is. So let us keep supporting our local businesses that go 110%, that employ lo local people, and really have a heart. It's, you'll find Shawnigan is very upset about the thought of losing another local homegrown company that everyone loves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, go to the podium. My name's Sharon Bovair. I'm from Mill Bay. Um, I must say, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable, as are many other people, with um, the CVRD using my tax dollars to put a business out of uh, out of business, I, I, a local business, um, you're trying to encourage us to shop local and do all the stuff local, and here you are trying to take a conglomeration, and it just doesn't sit well. Um, your history here with the waste management, you have taken on this pan disposal once before and um, almost put them out. You have tried to do this with the Eco Depot and put Fisher Road out. That didn't bode very well. Um, I'm just not sure that I understand why, what the motivation is here. What's the agenda for this plan? Why would you fix something that's not broken at this point? And I'm quite happy with the user pay thing. Very often, I only need our garbage picked up once a month. I don't want to pay for a weekly thing that I'm not using, for one. Pan Disposal has served this 
community extremely well, and I think it's really short-sighted of you people to, and a little bit hypocritical, I might add, to say that we should do local stuff and then want to do this in a bigger way for the CVRD to take over someone's business. So you're not just affecting them, you're, just, you're affecting people. We go into places like Laughing Llama to buy our tickets to put on our garbage. We buy other things when we're in Laughing Llama at the same time. So it's not just about disposal. It's about the country charm. It's about the reason we're here. Thank you. Yeah, come to the podium. Uh, my name is uh, Charles Ayres, uh, president of Mariner Ridge in Couch and Bay. We utilize pan disposal. They've been really good to us. They pick up our solid waste and our uh, organic waste. The reason we most need them is that we uh, have very narrow lanes up to our properties, very steep, and pan disposal have the vehicles to do this, and the CBRD <coughs> do not. They did attempt to uh, navigate our lanes to pick up the recycling, which we now have no pickup for, and they couldn't do it. So I am here just to speak that we have that need and uh, pan disposal fits it. Uh, we have no problems with them. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. There's somebody over there. Come to the podium. Microphone, please. Madam Chair, Directors, Roland Taylor from Shawnigan Lake. I just wanted to, to ask three questions. Um, of all of the many letters that were sent, uh, with regards to the proposed mandate on garbage and organics collection. Uh, why were the letters not uh, submitted uh, with, with the um, included as part of the uh, process for this uh, decision? Um, many of the people, were, it was clearly, they were clearly opposed to the mandate and simply because they had mentioned pan disposal or our service provider, those letters were not submitted. So that's my question to you. It doesn't seem fair. All of the letters clearly say that, that I know my letter says that I was opposed to this mandate. And why is the CBRD considering spending mi millions of dollars on uh, something that is not required in our area, or maybe A, B, and C areas, when uh, the resources could be better spent in areas that no long that no ha have no service, or uh, industrial and commercial sectors where they they are the most uh, uh, waste. They put out most waste. Residential is should be on the bottom list um, after you finish with with those two. And with all due respect to the current uh, board members and the current area directors, um, I'm just wondering, it's my understanding that uh, they will not be um, present for the initiation of this proposed mandate. So I'm wondering if it should not be put forward to the new area directors and uh, the new uh, board members for uh, consideration and and for the public to to have some input on this because it, it came up rather quickly and and I I think that uh, that everyone should be everyone should be felt with a respectful manner um, thank you thank you I think I saw one more one more hand up did I not if you could come to the podium Bernie Yearling, Mill Bay. So we buy pan disposal tickets and put out garbage maybe every six weeks. And very low cost to us. So it's an inducement to reduce garbage, uh, having to pay directly. Also, my property tax went up 8% this past year, 7.3% for the CBRD component. I'm on a fixed pension with no cost of living increases. So I shudder to think what the increase would be if the CBRD took over garbage collection. Thank you. Are there any more speakers? 
see no more speakers. So we'll move on. Thank you. We're moving on now to delegation. We have Gary Horwood, Stronigan Residents Association. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. So good morning, Madam Chair, CVRD Board or Regional Services Committee and staff. My name is Gary Horwood and I am the president of the Shawnigan Residents Association, the SRA. Thank you for the opportunity to, to present to you this morning. I would also like to thank board members for serving, for serving our community. It's a four year gig and it's not easy. Not easy to run, not easy to work. You live in a fishbowl. You have just come through an election. And some of you are returning, others are not. There's nothing easy here, and then, well, there's now. When people like me and some others here this morning have spoken, uh, we have a disagreement. So politics and policies aside, thank you. You're going to notice, at least I think you're going to notice, I didn't come and look at this side of the podium, but you're going to notice my right arm is tremoring, and uh, you're probably thinking, what's with that guy? Is he just super nervous, or is he a jackass, or what? <laughs> well, it's a simple explanation. I have Parkinson's, and this is how it manifests itself. It's slow moving. I'm as healthy as a horse, except for this one thing. I can't uh, control it. I can manage it. I put my hand in my pocket. I put my hand behind my, my back. If I'm in church, I put it on the rail in front of me. But it's, 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 it's funny what the things you find that you can do. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when I fall asleep at night, it stops right away. I can't control it. And the only, re the only explanation I can give you is... Um, it's like my wife and kids. I can't control them, and I think everybody can understand that, and you know I'm kidding. The reason I'm here is to speak to the Solid Waste Management Plan. I'm here to request that you consider two options. One, that you not include Area B in this proposal. Secondly, that you delay the vote on this initiative until the new board is sworn in. With all due respect, you're in the 12th hour. This is a major decision, major money involved, major change. Last spring, I was in Victoria meeting with Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The purpose of that meeting was to talk about municipal status. It was a great meeting, had a wonderful time, found people to be engaged, helpful, wanting to help, and uh, encouraged me. The takeaway from that meeting overarching all the other discussion was this one thing. Gary, we are not going to engage with you because the board that's in place, not only in, in our regional district, but all the regions in the, and municipalities in the province are lame duck. You're in the last few months. Why would we put our time and effort into dealing with people who may not be in power after October the 20th? That was the message. So I say to you, that's my message, one of my messages here this morning. It occurs to me that there has been no timely, meaningful, effective communication to the residents of, of Area B. Yes, I am sure there is protocol for getting information out. My best hunch is if we stop now and talk to those people who, who were responsible for communicating to uh, Area B, there would be process and protocol. And they would produce pages, not pages, but a list of things that they do, and all the boxes would be checked off. And I'm sure they're well spoken, and I honor that. But the fact of the matter is, that's not how you, how you measure good communication. It would sound effective, sound proper, like everybody's done their job, but that's not the measurement. The measurement is simply this. Was it effective? If it's not effective, 
then you're not communicating. It's like the old adage, with, are, are you leading? Well, if there's nobody behind you, you're not leading. I got to tell you, it hasn't been effective in our area. And I'm assuming, or not assuming, my information is that it hasn't been effective in areas A, B, or C. Maybe you are satisfied with the status quo. I can tell you I'm not, and the constituents of area B are certainly not. As an example, About 10 years ago, one of my sons got into some, some trouble. And I'm talking serious trouble. I'm talking serious addictions and alcohol. He wasn't near death, but he was fast approaching it. He reached out to Brenda and I. He wanted help. And we wanted to help him. He'd been disenfranchised from the family for years. He lived in Victoria. We live in Vancouver. He had a job, no money, and a cell phone, no landline. The only thing he had on his cell phone was texting ability because he couldn't afford anything else. And 10 years ago, texting for me was the farthest thing that I was interested in. I'm fairly successful in both business, my family, and in my private life. If I want to talk to somebody, I get on the phone and I talk to them. I had no use for texting. And quite frankly, what I used to say was, why would I text somebody if I can call them and talk to them? But I had a decision to make. Did I want to be effective communicator with my son or not? Or did I just want to appear to be an effective communicator? Because I could have said all kinds of things to the rest of the family and the extended family that what I'd done to try and reach out to my son. So I made a decision to change and I changed into something that was totally foreign to me. Sounds silly now, because I mean, three-year-olds know how to text. But at that time, it wasn't for, for me. So I learned how to text. And what that means is I had to learn a new language. And that sounds silly today, because everybody texts. This whole thing sounds silly, but it's true. I remember one of the texts he sent me. He had this word, when I say word, phrase. And it had the digit two, M, O, R, R, O. And everybody's nodding and saying, yeah, that's simple. I looked at that. I couldn't figure out what the Sam Hilly was trying to tell me. It's tomorrow. But it was a new language, and I had to learn it. So I made a choice to step out of my comfort zone, to be effective and communicate with my son, to be an encourager, to come alongside of them and to help them. And, and I'm not exaggerating this, ladies and gentlemen. That's what it took to get on his, his line, what he was happy with, what he was conversive with. Jennifer Davy certainly found an effective, efficient, and in inexpensive way to communicate a flyer. And she doesn't have the CVRD communications budget, expertise, or personnel. Our director, I'm told, I'm just reached out to the people in the communications sphere here. Sorry to interrupt. You have two minutes. Can I ask for another ten minutes? Looking to the committee. Seeing nods around the table. It's okay. Take a moment. I need a motion. We moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Our director reached out to the communications department and said, contact the SRA. Now, I'm not here to stand up and pound my chest about the SRA, but, you know, quite frankly, we have a pretty effective communication um, system in place. And uh, you just have to think back over the last number of years, what we've been able to accomplish, and most of that is done through communication. But nobody picked up on it. Nobody called us. Nobody came and said, look, can you help us out? Or can you just disseminate this information and get it out to the people? Because we know you're effective. Mandatory garbage pickup would mean it's controlled by the CVRD 
and everyone pays regardless of how much waste they produce. Now that sounds maybe, sil maybe silly, but the demographics of Area B don't seem to be considered here. 50% of our population is only here in the summer. Our community has clearly said they like having options and they're currently happy with what they've got. They like it. They don't want it to change. My understanding is there's a 2.7 million line item to implement this on an annual basis to implement this, this uh, program. Taxes are going up. We don't want our taxes going up. There's a $30,000 study to be done. Again, who's going to pay for it? Well, I got to tell you, we are. We, the PAT taxpayer. Community input seems to be dis discounted as not proper feedback or off topic. And that's sad. When our community is informed we, and aware, they turn up. September the 11th, 2018, community consultation at Cobble Hill, there was approximately 250 people. I'm told there was about a third, a third of that group was from Trondigan Lake, and that group was there because of the flyers. It was not an easy meeting. People were concerned. For the most part, our roads are small. We can't take big trucks. We don't want big trucks. And not all our roads are paved. For the most part, we are a rural and we are a rural and compost our waste. We are ahead of the curve. We have three bin process in place now. It works well. And I ask you, and somebody said it earlier, quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, if it ain't broke, why are you trying to fix it? I began by thanking you for serving. And I guess that begs the question, what is serving? Meeting the needs of the people. What are they asking for? What do they want? What are they expecting? And I'm asking you to consider that now and, and make a change. I started by saying I was asking for two, two things. That you not include Area B in the proposal or most importantly, that you delay the vote on this initiative until a new board is sworn in and we have time, we together have time to communicate to the constituents so that they are informed and can make a decision and you can know where they stand. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gary. Director Acton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to acknowledge Gary Harwood and the SRA for coming to speak and that uh, they are an excellent voice for the community. So the community does appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on now to correspondence. No correspondence, Madam Chair. Right. Information. No information items. Reports. The first report from the manager of recycling and waste management regarding the solid waste management plan update number four. Welcome to Seif. You'll introduce the speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. So just quickly, we have a, a, a handout um, and, and within the presentation that we'll make today, the budgetary things are not very visible, so we're just going to uh, hand those out. So. Madam Chair, with your permission, I wanted to uh, start by, by thanking the, uh, our CVRD Oversight Committee for their, um, for their um, involvement into the process, uh, their direction and vision and support. Um, I also wanted to thank um, our Solid Waste Plan Advisory Committee, PAC. Uh, they were all volunteers and, and they work with us um, very diligently, hard work, understanding the system and going into the future because this plan is for 10 years. So as we all know that solid waste management plan, it's, uh, it, it'll define the next, next decade of how we manage our waste. 
um, and we'll go through the presentation. That presentation will um, discuss the process that we've taken through. Um, the process um, is, uh, is the guidance that we have uh, followed through. That was the Ministry of Environment guidance, um, uh, guiding document for preparing the solid waste management plan. And that also includes the, um, uh, the public consultation process. And within all consultation process, it is one of our duties to include all information um, that we have received throughout the process. Uh, the only thing that you probably not see within that would be the, uh, the names and addresses uh, because of the, um, uh, the, the information we have taken that out. The other un information, all of that will be included within the, within the process. So solid waste plan, um, uh, when we go through the, the process, I just wanted to say, um, by just looking at 30,000 feet above, um, one way to go that about is um, collecting everything, all inclusive, and, and some communities, they have their landfills, they have waste to energies, they have uh, the MRF mixed recycling facilities, and, and they bring it all out, and then they separate and segregate, and then, um, and then reuse, recycle, and dispose from, from that end. Um, this PAC committee has, has gone through this and understanding our system, what our system, what the, the infrastructure we have currently is uh, two public recycling centers, one transfer station, public transfer station. We have a few uh, privately owned recycling centers and also composting facilities. So we have a system in place. Um, so rather than going into creating more MRFs, um, mixed recycling facilities and having post handling what we receive from residential, commercial, multifamilies, and all that. The idea here is to work as a community where our children and uh, business person and industrial people, we all uh, understand uh, the importance and, and need for the reuse, recycling, and, and before disposing of, understanding where, where that is happening. Having said that, our plan would also consider if there are new technologies, they, they come into being in the future, and, and understanding if there are any recycling um, uh, waste to energy facilities, for example, in other jurisdictions or whatnot, if they happen, then we'll be able to amend this, this plan. Having said that, just by, by looking at the creating new facilities, we also have looked into what is it available uh, for us as of today in terms of uh, disposal of, of our remaining garbage. So we had done the, um, uh, the request for information, and what we received was, was one landfill where we're currently dealing with, one landfill on um, at Cash Creek Landfill where we used to uh, uh, send our, our, our garbage. And this, this is not ready, by the way. This, will, this is probably will be ready, and again, probably is a strong word for, for next year at some point in time because they're still waiting for their, uh, for their permits. There has been some information that there could be some other waste to energy type of facilities. They could be, uh, they could come in, on, in the horizon, but that's in the future again, so we don't have any of those, uh, those things at this moment. Uh, so by having said that, I, I wanted to introduce uh, Tamara Schulman. She's here from TetraTax, so she'll go through the presentation. Once you complete the presentation, we'll go through the question and answers. Um, and I also wanted to say thanks to uh, the management and the support staff. They have helped me with, the, with this, this plan as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. And I'm Chair and Directors. Thank you for having me. Again, my name is Tamara Schultz. I'm with Tetra Tech. I've been working to support um, different levels of public sector and private businesses alike on solid waste management plans and other waste reduction initiatives over the years. And in BC, we've been part of uh, several of these plans in the last couple of years. So I was, um, I was fortunate to be able to bring some of that context as well as diving in deep on all of the um, all of the local variables that everyone's very thoughtfully struggling with and figuring out what really makes sense long term. Um, so we will wind up addressing a lot of the questions that have already come up. I do want to start at the at the beginning to give you an overview of what's yes. Thank you. I'll sound so much better now. Um, I want to give an overview of what you find in the staff report, and um, and of course we'll we'll dive into the deeper parts of the report as it relates to um, as it relates to the PowerPoint. 
So for the agenda, we'll go through the solid waste management plan, just some context of why we're doing this, um, an overview of the consultation up front, since it was an important part of the overall process, guiding principles, goals and targets, that again, the public advisory committee, the PAC worked, worked on and helped to um, adapt and make sense for this local context for CVRD. Uh, we'll review the 13 strategies and how those came to be. Um, and what the drivers were behind in terms of areas of improvement. We'll look at timeline and bu budget as well as some next steps. So first, to give some broader context, uh, the Cowichan Valley Regional District has been a leader in zero waste since initiative since 2002. Um, the community was among the first to implement some of the food scraps collection programs. Often when we're in other areas, we're back pointing to Cowichan Valley and saying, look at some of these uh, services that have been provided and um, some of the corresponding results. Community takes pride in sustainability um, and, uh, and has a carbon neutral status. There are still challenges, however, that need to be worked through. As Tasif had mentioned, there is not a local land, a, a landfill in the region, and that contract for disposal is up. We'll talk about that more in one of the strategies. Um, disposal charges are on the rise. Nobody wants a landfill. Other facilities, technologies are expensive. They need a business case and capital. The best practice is to figure out how to reduce it in the first place, ultimately. That's this overall drive. Recycle BC, the product steward that oversees the Blue Box program now, they find in communities that don't have the three stream collection built in that the contamination rates are inherently higher. And there is um, documentation that has come from them um, to the CVRD to say that actually the contamination levels at 15% and it's supposed to be under 3%. So that's another big issue that needs to be handled and that um, some of the strategies help to address. There's still garbage burning, illegal dumping. Many communities are dealing with that in an ongoing way and there's ways to mitigate and, and work on those issues. The market's shifting as well. Folks have heard of the, the China National Sword. It doesn't mean recycling's over. It means that we need to be smarter about how we create our products, manufacturers, you know, vote with our dollars, and also how we um, how we sort our materials and what markets they go to and diversifying those markets and having local in North America markets too. Um, but it is something that affects the overall system. And then um, what s systems and programs do we have in place for that long-term vision, right? The plan needs to be in place for the 10 years. We want to look beyond that so that we don't have issues like, you know, you know, that we're not dealing with historical impacts in whatever way. One was mentioned during the delegation around a local dump, right? We want to have the foresight to avoid the things that we don't know yet. So in terms of the solid waste management plan, the legislation from the province, the Environment Management Act, has been in place since 1995 to say that regional districts must um, have these plans and update them regularly. So this is Amendment 4 for this 10-year plan and 25-year vision. The province also has some targets for regional districts um, that help to support direction um, setting related to the plan. One of the, uh, the first one here is related to organics, so compostable organics, your yard trimmings, food scraps, food soiled paper, and the goal is to have 75% of BC's population covered by organics disposal restrictions. So that's essentially disposal ban saying, hey, you have to have all your systems in place because when you go to the transfer station, if you got, you know, from a grocery store and you get a whole bunch of material that rolls out or from any generator, you could get a fine. And the next one is around extended producer responsibility. Like any uh, field, we have our, we're in the land of acronyms, so that's what EPR stands for. Um, and there's legislation set up for all of these different products we touch, right? Beverage containers, um, fluorescent light bulbs, batteries, computers, um, other electronics that says, you know, 75% of those materials need to be recovered by the manufacturers and the brand owners that bring them in. So we are fortunate to have very progressive legislation in BC that doesn't just put it on the taxpayers, but that says, hey, we need to be responsible for the whole cycle of our product. Um, of course, it can always be higher. You think about something like tires, you don't want to just get 75%. You want to 
get them all, right? So that's an, a, a place where regional districts can have a role in advocating with senior governments around what that legislation looks like. The third is, to, is related to disposal. Um, the intent is to lower the provincial municipal solid waste disposal rate to 350 kilograms per capita. Note that that is by 2020 um, and will likely continue to, to decrease, right? So there's several variables that influence how much, um, how much garbage per capita we generate. And it's not just what you set out at curbside or take to the depot, it's all of the materials that are generated by commercial and indu light industrial and other forms combined into one number. So um, the CVA is fortunate to have a fairly low rate. There's other things that factor in related to industry um, and population size, demographics um, that matter when you start looking across regional districts. So there's always more to do, is the short of it. Jumping over to the process, the uh, Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy um, does have a guideline to help inform how regional districts go through the process, um, and the CVRD has gone through each of these uh, four steps at this point. The first step was to initiate the planning process, put the word out, um, a lot of um, contact across sectors to individuals to make sure that um, the recruitment process for getting folks onto the pack was thorough, um, getting information up on the website, holding initial uh, meetings and sta with stakeholders in an open house. Um, two is setting the plan direction. The PAC met several times, which I'll show in a subsequent slide, um, to go ahead and set that direction, look at current realities, become informed. What's the waste composition study? What's the amount of garbage tonnage? Where does it go? What is the status of programs? What's working? What's not? From there, filling in those gaps and, look, and, and looking for areas to how to meet the, um, the needs and prove from, um, from some of the challenges um, and build those options and evaluate them. Um, the, um, the fourth is to prepare and adopt the plan and go through the process coming to you all and eventually going to the province. The consultation process took place throughout, the, throughout each of these steps with a significant push um, as some of those plan components came up. Each tech memo and information piece along the way was put online. And there are several key players in the process. So you can see in the middle, we've got the CVRD technical team, the folks that have to go and implement a plan that gets passed afterwards, and we are involved as the consultant. Um, going across, um, starting on the left-hand side, the advisory committee, which in this case was combined, public and technical, um, had a center role and represented um, residents, <coughs> businesses and other folks um, to be able to provide all of those perspectives and have yet another way to feed into an ongoing engagement even beyond consultation in that public meeting so that um, so that that feedback could be put in throughout um, cross departmental um, steering committee meeting um, steering committee was part of the process uh, the oversight committee which um, had CVRD directors some of whom are in the room um, there was public consultation that we've spoken to and um, we'll speak to more in, in terms of some of the uh, summarized outcomes. There were special interest groups, um, really stakeholders, folks that care. There's industry there that, um, and groups and businesses that really make up a really important part of the solid waste management, um, of how solid waste is managed in the region. And there were convened First Nations groups, multiple points of contact and direct meetings and other folks as well. Um, in terms of uh, the process, again, we're here um, you know, at the, the committee meeting and I know the board meeting is this afternoon um, to go through this in detail and, um, and have you vote on the resolution. And then from there, the process is to go, um, the plan, if passed, would then go to the ministry um, for um, some, it would be a submission to go to the ministry. Um, in terms of the process, um, it started um, earlier than March, actually it was January when it came and this group said, you know, go forth, let's make this happen, let's keep it, um, make sure that it's thorough, let's make sure that there's engagement throughout and let's make sure that it's done in a way that uses resources well because again it does use the taxpayers resources to go through these processes with a net gain in the end of having the efficiency and having the waste reduction. 
Um, then uh, the group first convened in March and met uh, several times throughout uh, the spring and summer to do the deep dive on all of these issues. Um, you can see in the bottom row there was consultation um, in terms of getting website up, establishing the pack, using PlaySpeak, the online forum, um, a um, an online survey was put up, there was an earlier open house before the the strategies were solidified to make sure those extra inputs were coming in. Um, and then the consultation phase, uh, phase three that we called it in August, September, and, and we're here now. So let's jump into consultation and some of the high level outcomes um, that are also included in, in the broader and plan in a separate summary. Um, so for web-based participation, there was quite extensive involvement. You can see it was over 20,000 folks that were, um, that were checking in, look, participating in the surveys, um, 700, um, going to the website um, just to, to look at what the process was, download background information, over 1,000. Um, social media, active with social media as it related to all of, to, let, to driving people to the website and giving people updates on what was happening at over 17,000. Um, PlaySpeak, the interactive forum, had over 1,000 involved. And then uh, for the more in-depth surveys that took some time to complete, um, another, um, another 260 or so. Um, for some drill down in addition to that 21,000, there were 21 in-person events with 547 people reached, um, three surveys with uh, 960 responses, and uh, more than uh, 440 verbal and written comments, um, which were captured and put in that consultation summary. Again, um, the names redacted, but the information um, kept in. So, and thank you for the use of the photos in retroactively. Um, for the second survey, that was specific to looking at the 13 strategies and how they were received by the overall regional district um, in terms of the residents that, that took the time to, to put them out. So you can see by the darker green bar um, that the strategies generally had um, strong support. Um, with some variation, you can see that um, for a lot of them it was, it was well um, over um, 80 of the 120 participants were, um, um, were strongly supportive, and then you can see the, the light green somewhat supportive, and, uh, and then the, red, the darker red bar of the not support. So um, these were the folks, I think, that in large part took the time to understand the bigger issues that we're gonna dive into even more in this presentation, and thinking about what are these long-term solutions that we need to reduce waste, to be efficient as it relates to costs and what the taxpayer um, needs to be putting in to the system over time. A dive into some of the data. Every waste-related uh, conversation needs a pie graph. And this is the representative one for this process. Um, so you can see when you look at what's still in the garbage um, that the two green pieces, which represent the, the food that could have been eaten at 90, 19%, and the inedible organic materials, your peels, your other things that just do make sense to have um, um, processed, um, comes to um, over 30%. Um, and then um, we're looking at the blue. You can see that there's still recyclables for everything we know about mixed containers and paper. It still finds its way into the garbage. Those are gaps in systems, but those are also gaps in, in people's level of awareness and going even beyond awareness to how to change behavior and, and get folks motivated. Um, drilling down into that, we were able to actually see some specific differences in what the proportion of organics was in the garbage depending on what the collection type was. There are a lot of folks, I will say up front, including many folks in the room, that divert as much as they absolutely can. There's others that if the system's not there, it's not really convenient, maybe aren't going to be those high performers. For the system to work, we need everybody. We need the middle and late adopters to also be on board. Um, so you can see here for the, um, um, the 
places that have mandatory organics collection, the proportion of garbage, of organics in the garbage is 23%. So it shows that we still have a ways to go, right? Even with when we have that, but that's where we put the system in place and then have the programs to support it and to shift those norms over time. Uh, where it's optional, it goes up to closer to 30%, and where there's not, um, organics collection available, whether it's um, CVOD or opt-in, um, it goes even higher to 36%. It's also important when doing these assessments to look at how much garbage we're actually dealing with and what the disposal rates are. So what this table shows is a breakdown of what's disposed by sector. So you can see between the, the single families and, and municipal areas and electoral areas, we're looking at about 19, almost 20% of the garbage is from those residential areas. Um, multifamily, 8%. Industrial, commercial, and institutional, the ICNI sector, 41% takes time to tackle that, but there's great ways to do that and the strategies, um, you know, dive into all of these to go, how do we get these materials that we know we can recycle and compost out of the garbage? Um, so we're looking at a total tonnage then from the regional district of 30,608 tons, which comes to the per capita disposal rate of 358 kilograms per capita. Even with some of these challenges, right? There's still, there's, um, there, that's still, um, quite a positive outcome. And then the recycling rate is also estimated and, and calculated with a per capita rate. In terms of guiding principles, um, the, the group, the PAC spent several rounds going through and, and, and figuring out what really resonated and what needed to be adapted a little bit to, to be appropriate for the CVRD and the, lo and the local community and, and concerns and also opportunities for success. Um, so just going through from the top, um, promoting zero waste approaches and supporting a circular economy. We want the outputs to be inputs to new processes. It feels abstract sometimes, but that is where we're going in the big picture when we talk about a circular economy. Um, we want to promote the first three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, folks put in, rethink and refuse and some other R's above that. Um, but having that waste prevention is, is key and, and important and something that folks, especially you know, at, a, at the personal level, we all are, we, many folks invest in. Um, maximizing the, benefited, the beneficial use of discarded materials and manage, re, managing residual important, um, appropriately is also important. Um, Supporting structural and systemic change, um, and then the corresponding behavior change programs to optimize those system changes and promote uh, um, the above principles. That was something that the group did customize to say, hey, it's not enough just to put the system there. We actually need to get people to use it, and we want to be really specific about that in our community. Uh, preventing organics and recyclables from going into the garbage wherever practical. Again, it's a combination of the above that helps to do that and then uh, develop um, collaborative partnerships with interested parties to achieve regional targets set in the plans. There's a lot of par partnerships that are in place. That's how to strengthen those and cultivate new ones. And then uh, support practical and effective delivery of waste management services from public and private service providers and level the play playing field within the region for private and public solid waste management facilities. So that's a mouthful. Essentially, it's recognizing that it does take a collaborative effort to get these systems in place in an efficient way, and you want to be able to support that in a way that has the optimal value and access for the residents and for the taxpayers that are using the system. A, some modeling, you, looking at the waste composition categories and by sector and thinking about if you, you know, took half of the existing recycling or half of the existing um, organics that's in that, in the garbage and took that out, what, how low could you get that per capita disposal number? So there was a whole modeling exercise that we went through with uh, extensive involvement from the PAC to come up with these targets. So um, the outcomes was that uh, even though the, the ministry asked mainly for the 10-year one, there was a decision made to put a five-year plan or five-year target into place going down to 280 kilograms per capita. And the intent behind that is that when some of these other systems go in place so that, that all of these services are provided 
for residential and um, and commercial, that that's going to ultimately get a big drop, right, when it goes in conjunction with the behavior change programs. Um, the 10-year target is at 250 kilograms per capita, and that's about optimizing some of those system changes that are in strategy one, two, one through three that we'll go through. Um, have that disposal um, ban in place with all of the education and actually be in the position to start enforcing it and then getting some of the other strategies um, online to um, ensure resilience in the system. You can collect it all, you have to make sure it has a place to go and that those systems all are working smoothly. There's also a long-term target for 2040 of going to 150 kilograms per capita uh, for the disposal rate. Um, Again, it's um, committing to that continual improvement, getting that product design change from some of those outside forces that we can influence in some ways but not completely control, and ultimately move towards being a zero waste community. CBRD is not the only one doing this. There are many groups that are setting these ambitious targets that are getting to the high 80s and low 90s in terms of the diversion rate, um, and uh, it's about following suit and, and continuing to be a leader. So now we'll go through the strategies um, that again are informed by the diversion um, potential um, and we'll also speak to some of the resource requirements over the duration of a 10 year period. So you've got in front of you a budget that shows the by year these, these, strat these costs related to, or the budget related to these strategies is, is totaled over that 10 year period. Um, another point of note is that the intent is that the time that existing staff are the ones to implement this um, so that and it's and with the schedule that you see with the green bars in front of you those are some of the initiatives are staggered to help make that possible that said a lot of the initiatives are pushed to at least get rolling within that first five years because there is that sense of urgency given not, there's not disposal options um, in in the region and that that cost um, we, we're not as easily able to control that. So for the first strategy, um, that's reduction and reuse opportunities. Again, this stayed on the radar. People want to push into push upstream, as we say, and look at ways to reduce um, reduce waste in general. Reducing food waste is a, is a huge. Uh, has had a huge insurgence. People recognize not just the environmental issues associated, but the social and economic. The stats run that basically when, as a consumer, when we walk out of the grocery store with four bags of groceries, we may as well leave one in the parking lot. That is how much food gets wasted. And that is our edible food. That's, I'm not talking about banana peels. So um, there are some great programs and initiatives out there to support that behavior change, uh, work with consumer facing businesses um, to, to increase that awareness and, and get that um, and get that more of that um, food recovered and, and not wasted. Um, so being part of that is what uh, the is what A is about here under the subcategories of components. Um, for B, um, explore other reduction and reuse opportunities. You can see on the right there's a restore there from Habitat for Humanity, there's repair cafes, there's all sorts of interesting ways to be able to influence um, how we reduce and reuse materials. I should point out too that while there are some specifics in the plan, it does have a high level element to it because it, it's lasting over quite a period so that there is some flexibility as new ideas and initiatives and um, emerge that, that the implementation phase of this plan can be adjusted to um, take the best of what's out there at a given time and not be overly prescriptive. Uh, for C, supporting bans on single use items. Folks been to City of Victoria anytime recently? You go in, you're like, oh, my, the bag in the car, in the bag, right? We, we're getting even better about doing that. And having that push, um, it has gone through Supreme Court. It has deemed to be something that is an option. A lot of coastal communities have been early adopters. Most of the cities on the coast in California already have these things in place um, to help minimize some of the litter issues and get people to be smarter around some of the, um, how they're handling um, their, how much waste they're generating. 
Advocating for expansion of extended producer responsibility programs is also in the mix here as spoken to previously. And so the operating cost, again, over that 10-year period for this uh, is just over $100,000. And for most of these items, we're looking at a mix of uh, promotion and um, and collateral and, and getting events into place and conducted um, some support around bylaw development and, and those sorts of things that go in. Um, and that the timeline for that is 2019 um, through 2023. Of course, these are things that can be extended and it's likely that there would be a five-year review that would happen to be able to continue to fine tune as well. Strategy two, reduce disposal from ICNI, again, uh, industrial, commercial, and institutional, and multifamily residential sectors. These are grouped because a lot of the programs and the regulatory tools are quite similar for addressing both. And this is where we're talking about well over 40% of the waste stream. Um, so adopting, um, so that there are some existing disposal bans in CVRD, um, and then the intent is to adopt an organics disposal ban as well, which we've found in a lot of communities, really does move the needle. Through the consultation process, people understanding um, it's, the, it, it's the carrot and stick approach, right? And even the education side of it makes quite a difference. Um, the publicity it receives and then the actual being able to back it up is also um, key. Um, so for strategies A's, um, we've got $10,000 to be done in 2020. And again, that's, um, that's putting the bylaws together to be able to say, hey, you need to source separate. This is actually required that you have these containers in this space and that you're participating in these programs and then the, the ban backs it up. Um, we found what's most effective with bans is to have a pretty extensive engagement process around it so that um, you've got the industry, the haulers on board, residents and businesses, folks understand what they need to do um, to be in compliance. Strategy three, is the one we've uh, been discussing since the outset here, or an aspect that, that influences it, which is uh, to reduce disposal from residential sector. As a principle, I think we're all on board to say that reducing waste even more from residents is a, is a positive thing. This plan is here to say, um, to say what we're doing, but not specifically how. It's not prescribing that we're saying public sector or private sector or which hauler. It's saying that we need to have the universal collection because, I'm sorry, I'm jumping to B, I'll go back up to A here, um, but that when we've got the, you know, we already have recycling at the curb. When you have the garbage and the organics at the curb in, in a consistent way, you get a 35 to 40% drop in garbage tonnage. So for the folks that are already doing it, that are opting in in a way that makes sense, they're, they're likely getting that and it might even get better. There's folks out there that aren't yet participating and that's why these the, the garbage ton is as higher than, than it needs to be and why there's so much organics that's still in the garbage. So the intent is to be able to have that kind of success which happens very quickly because when you do it with the service shift to having every other week garbage, people put the smelly stuff in the container that gets collected more frequently. You're ultimately making the right thing to do the most convenient thing to do across the board, not just for the folks that are wanting to do the right thing, but for everyone. Um, so, um, and it does tie into the ministry targets um, and is following a trend that other regional districts are putting into place. Um, even rural areas up North Okanagan, Kitimat, Stikine, folks across the board are recognizing, okay, this is what I really need to do to, to move the needle in the community. And then for the implementation process, what's the most thoughtful way to do it in a way that is in compliance with CVRD procurement practices, um, again, offers the best value and access for the taxpayer and, uh, and, and creates a, a due process in a way that, that supports that societal good overall over the long term. I also want to address the, uh, the depot side of residential. Um, we um, looked at opportunities to increase the 
access um, to some of the public depots that do have limited hours. Again, from a budget management perspective, that's why, why a lot of those are put in. Is there a way to shuffle it to add resources and move them around so that those hours can be extended? Um, there's definitely an, uh, was desire and input from residents throughout the consultation process to want that to, ha to happen. Um, the second part is uh, just to continue to assess depot service levels uh, for the south end um, where, where Fisher Road does operate. Um, there's already agreements in place um, with CVRD for the Recycle BC products, right, for the um, for the mixed containers and paper, the, the, cur the blue box items, um, and to look for where those um, where there's other opportunities like that over time. So again, residents are, you know, they've got the access by it being there, but making sure that the um, that the value is also on par with what's happening across the community. So in terms of resource. Um, as it relates to, um, to strategy B, there is a $30,000 um, operating cost, which is for a study because this plan is not intended to set to every specific around how the curbside collection were to be set up. There's a lot of considerations, as already mentioned in the room, but also looking at what's the best frequency of collection for each material type, what materials should be collected, um, and, and going through that process and looking at routing what's efficient and also looking at public and private and how do you set up, um, set up that opportunity overall in a way that, that addresses as many of the issues that, um, that we can um, that have been discussed in the room about haulers and supporting business, et cetera, if it were to go that, that route. But there's a whole decision-making process and that's why that's there. Um, the other item um, does come to the, the 2.7 million per year, which was mentioned. It's important to note that this is not coming directly out of requisitions. It's not, it's not directly out of taxes, it's a user fee. Ultimately, everybody does pay to dispose of, of their materials, the garbage, um, the organics, um, and ideally source separated. It's about consolidating that cost into the user fee. It can be done with a user pay system so that folks that generate less um, uh, pay less. Um, I think understanding some of the dynamics in the community as it's moved forward, um, looking at some of the different issues related to season, you know, seasonal residents and other things um, is something that needs to be part of a broader consultation um, that relates specifically to, implement to implementation. Um, the reality is, though, is that there is a need to have that uniform service if we want to get the waste reduction based on what we've seen in many communities and how those numbers have run. Uh, we also want to, um, to make sure that it's done in a way that, um, that, is, that, is, that, is, equ that is equitable and has good value. Um, the reality is that some people pay school taxes and they don't have kids in the school at the time but they know that it's contributing to that greater good. There's a bit of a parallel that could be, um, that could be added here um, in a broader sense. Moving on through some of the other strategies, once you get this material collected, you wanna make sure that the processes and systems are in place to actually move it through the system so that it stays diverted. Um, the regional district is fortunate to have the um, organics processing in the region already. <laughs> The intent with this strategy is to continue to make sure that best practices for how um, organics are processed continue to be fine-tuned to minimize any issues around odor and leachate management. Um, the liquid that that uh, that can go away, if it, that can pour off if it's not managed well, um, and also look at capacity for local organics um, over time, and just make sure as that's coming out of the waste stream that it's there. So um, for strategy A, that's um, that's a short study to summarize that and, and work with those folks. And then uh, strategy B, that ongoing um, capacity is, is embedded um, over the course of the plan. Strategy five is looking at the recycling side of the same issue related to processing and uh, transfer capacity um, because there's not currently a materials recovery facility or a MRF in the region. So it goes to Nanaimo or Victoria. Um, how it gets collected uh, or how it gets consolidated to move to those areas is something that, um, that can be reviewed and look for efficiencies again um, in partnership with, uh, with, with public and private. 
For strategy six, we're looking at uh, to improve management of construction and demolition materials. Anybody who's gone by a construction site and seen that large roll-off container and you see everything in there, you go, oh, there's got to be a way we could we can divert those materials a little bit better. The first step is to, to monitor what's happening around it, what's staying in region, how much is getting separated, what's going out of region. Uh, develop a C and D waste management strategies. The next step is a lot of great initiatives out there that use a mix of regula regulatory tools and um, and education programs and other motivators to to work on this issue. Um, and then C is uh, to reduce barriers to disposing hazardous materials. This has a close tie-in with illegal dumping. When it gets more expensive to deal with your gypsum. Um, because it may have asbestos, that's what you start seeing on the on the curb side. How do you, for those smaller generators, the DIY folks, how do you make sure that the costs are low enough so that they c aren't going to be tempted to do that um, and are going to come in and and dispose of it for a lower cost? So um, strategy C, you can see the operating cost um, is eight hundred thousand. Again, that when you annualize it, it's. Uh, it, it comes down to about 100000 a year to be able to offer a subsidy to help make that program happen in a way that not only supports diversion, but also helps to mitigate some of the illegal dumping issues. Strategy, so now we're moving on to uh, recovery and residuals management. Um, strategy seven is specifically related to that and exploring options for disposal. Uh, Tassif spoke to it, but I'll do a, a recap here with the. Uh, with the visual uh, for short term, um, there is the option to do continued waste export um, to Washington State. It's $140 a ton and, uh, and goes by rail. Landfills, uh, landfill in BC is another option, again, with, with Cache Creek. And then the third would be to pursue a private waste to energy option if somebody can make a business case and come in and find partnerships and get it funded. Um, again, that would be a longer that would be in the, in the, it wouldn't happen immediately like the other two. There would be some planning, but it is an option potentially um, for the shorter term. For long term disposal options, uh, there's still a few others that apply here. Uh, landfill disposal on the island is something to continue to, to ask the question about. There is a group that, that meets island wide to look at waste management issues, and the, and Comox Valley in particular does have a new landfill cell. Um, we just have to see how that plays out. Um, there's also looking at waste to energy in terms of multiple technologies. Um, and um, at this point, however, the studies that have been done have shown that there's just not a business case. There's not enough throughput to be able to justify the amount of capital costs that needs to be amortized over a given period. There's also, as you could see from the other numbers, still a lot that we can do to reduce the total amount of garbage and then figure out what needs to happen to the appropriate scale. Um, and so for this, I should mention too, um, again, these are on, ongoing projects, but a deeper dive in terms of going through procure, procurement process and an additional study. For strategy eight, uh, it's to augment illegal dumping prevention strategies. There's already work being done on this, but it, it kept coming up, and so it made it as a, as a strategy to continue to fine tune. There um, has been campaigns done in the past. There's a free tipping policy that was implemented with a cap, but uh, to support um, the nonprofit organizations who do some of the cleanup on public lands. Um, and then um, there's also, um, just a need to look at what else could be done um, in terms of regulation and fines and, and those sorts of things. And so this is something that's embedded and happens over the full course of the of the tenure plan. Strategy nine, we're getting there, um, is uh, collection and drop off uh, for a series of challenging materials. So it's household hazardous waste, bulky items, and organic larger organics debris. And they each have slightly um, different challenges and slightly different solutions, but got grouped. Uh, the first is to look at um, how the collection of household hazardous waste can be improved, especially for those products that aren't currently covered by extended producer responsibility programs. What do you do with when you go into the garage or into whatever storage space and find that odd collection of bottles? Where does it go? So that can be dealt with by having different kinds of drop-off um, activities and, again, 
the intent is there, how it gets implemented is something that, um, that, that goes into that next phase once the plan's passed um, or moving forward. B is to um, improve recycling opportunities for bulk items, things such as mattresses, furniture, those are the things you don't want to see on the side of the road. They're also the things that you want to have a way to deconstruct and not have bulk up in the landfill or take a lot to put on rail and, and, and transport. So that's in here as well. Um, and then uh, the third is to assess effective ways to reduce open burning of wood waste. You've got that brush pile, you know, out comes the lighter. We, we've seen it all happen. It, it's tempting, it makes it go away, um, but there's not just the waste-related issues, there's air quality-related issues as well, and there needs to be creative solutions to work through. Um, so there are some operating costs um, related to doing the, the collection and expanding um, um, infrastructure to be able to handle um, the, some of those bulk items. With strategy 10, um, this has to be in, according to the ministry, and it's already happening, uh, where these, disposal, these historic um, disposal sites do need to be monitored and managed over time. So that's an existing budget and does take place. Operational improvements is the last set here. Strategy 11 um, is implementing the asset management plan. The CVRD already has an asset management planning process in place, um, the solid waste um, facilities need to be a part of that. And uh, there's also, with Bings Creek Transfer Station in particular, um, the need for a 10-year plan. Assets, you know, whether it's buildings or other types of equipment or vehicles, only last so long. The, mo the better the, um, the O&M, the operations and, um, and maintenance plans for those assets, the better they are. The, more, the longer the assets can can last, and so the operating costs here are related to looking at those O and M, to increasing the the O and M to make those assets last for longer, and that's in there for 2019 to 2023, and then the Bings Creek transfer station is a plan that needs to be de um, developed for um, a, a, a small study. Strategy 12, second last one is a d disaster debris management plan. Um, the regional district does not currently have a plan. This is something that's generally um, put together by multiple departments, sometimes with a little bit of support. You can see there's um, support there for the plan development um, to look at not just solid waste, but what are some of the other variables related to utilities and, and, um, and general emergency management. Um, as it relates to solid waste, what do you do when you have a fire and everybody's unplugged their, you know, not everybody's unplugged their fridge? What do you do with all of those different goods? What do you do with the, all the extra brush and what sites do you need as temporary for being able to man manage the, de the debris short term? So it's, it's mapping out as much as we, we can without an event actually occurring. Strategy 13 is embedded and really is important for all of the above strategies. It's around the education and behavior change. And you can give people a brochure and say, here's this information. We find over time, though, that that's not quite enough. People need to know, need to be motivated with specific tools to know how to shift those so that we get that norm shift and those new habits and behaviors over time. And that's where um, there's a concept called community-based social marketing that looks at what are these specific barriers, um, what are the motivators for how we, how, we, um, how we act, and then how do we target specific behaviors for change. So the CVRD staff already integrate these. It's about how the, making sure that it gets integrated over time. So this is the summary list. And you can see it's grouped again by waste reduction and diversion. Those first three is what's going to really help to reduce that tonnage short term. And then the others all are important related to the infrastructure, how we deal with recovery uh, and, res and residual management, and then supporting overall system resilience. The last section here relates to uh, budget and timeline. And I know this has come across the table here uh, before, but wanted to give a brief overview of the current budget, which is uh, 9.3, sorry, 
9.83 million um, annually. And the, um, you can see on the right the breakdown from last year's budget. If you look at the top here, you've got um, the curbside collection uh, for garbage, which again is covered through a user fee since, you know, and if, since people um, are going to pay something, whether they're going to transfer station, whether they're getting it curbside from CBRD or another um, subscription service, there is that cost. Um, the curbside collection for recycling, which is, which is um, covered in part by the stewardship program. Um, and then there's a whole series of other costs. Um, another one of note is the garbage uh, disposal, what it takes to, take down, to get it on the, the rails and send it down to Washington State is the almost 2.5 million. Um, and then keeping the other operations in place for, um, for both the disposal side and recycling and administering the, the programs, including the education programs. So when we look at the new budget here, which is um, in the second set of lines in, in the budget that you all have in front of you, um, you can see that the um, proposed new budget for 2019 is $195,800. Uh, um, it and then increases when you factor in the, the user fees associated with having the curbside program. So if you take out the just the the um, the, the curbside user fee and you just look at the increase for the other program costs, we're looking at 0.02% increase over the 10 year period. When you look at the combined operating budgets of the, the current and proposed, um, you're, for 2019 you're looking at 9.98 uh, million and then increasing to 14.47 million with that mix of the, the of inputs from the requisition budget as well as from um, the, the user fee side um, even more significantly. And then as a placeholder <laughs> for you to look at your hard copy, um, this is the 10-year the, the budget. Um, in the first set of uh, rows, you've got um, the revenue consolidated from its various sources. Um, and then the existing expenditures that we spoke to in the other slide. When you go down into the third set here, um, you've got the, the 13 strategies in any budget um, associated with those new programs, and then it reconciles through um, at, the, at the bottom. Um, for the proposed schedule, again, this is another, um, another scan with more detailed information in front of you. Um, this shows each of the 13 strategies plus their, their subcomponents and um, and when the when these programs are intended um, to be implemented. So for some, they span the entire um, the entire ten years. For others, um, there's there's some planning to be done. For example, before you go ahead and implement a bylaw mandating source separation for commercial. So that would happen in 2020 because you want to give some lead time um, for the disposal ban. We're also looking. Um, to get started right away. Um, so it starts from 2019 and then goes through solid for those first four years because it's recognized that it's a longer process. And then of course it stays in place after, but there's not as many resources that are needed. So that just gives you a couple of examples. So I, I pulled from the staff report, we pulled out the uh, recommended resolution that I wanted to go through. Um, Again, it says that the Solid Waste Management Plan update uh, Amendment 4 dated October 17th be approved and that the following approval for the Solid Waste Management Plan update be submitted to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy for approval. So that's <coughs> the, the, the primary piece here. Um, the, the other three um, relate to reinforcing that there was consultation that took place that was um, quite thorough and in compliance with the Environment Management Act um, of the province. Um, and three is related to um, being in compliance with the checklist of what the province also requires for the plan. Um, and the fourth is to the best of the knowledge of the Board of Directors that there, are, um, that there are no objectives to the plan that have not been acknowledged and addressed. So I 
think we are at the conclusion of the formal piece. I'll Thank pass you so to Madam much, Chair. Tamara. I have uh, a little bit of a speaker's list so far. I have Director Scott and then Director Marsh and then Director Davis. Uh, thank you, Mod Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, I am a survivor of the original garbage wars that happened many years ago, and we had a meeting in, I believe it was the Silver Bridge Inn, with over a thousand people who were very concerned about the changes that were being made uh, regarding this solid waste. Right now, um, Area H is uh, uh, has an annual cost for the the uh, solid waste that we have both the uh, the CVRD uh, situation as well as a private individual who comes and takes the things that the CVRD does not. The cost for that annually on my my t my uh, bill every year has been thirty five dollars. Uh, for the full year. So I, I don't see how we are going to be able to convince people that uh, this is a, is, is a change that's going to be beneficial when I really do not think it is. Um, I had uh, talked about having uh, one of our staff members come and uh, do a consultation meeting with my uh, two communities, both the Diamond and the North Oyster Halls, and so far, we have not been able to put, uh, uh, I haven't had a, a, a response that was favorable that we would do that. And I think that's very important because the people in my area have been, uh, had very successful things that they do. Uh, one of the things that was done even prior to this was the CVRD had um, for composting uh, containers, you, they, uh, we, got them all for a very inexpensive price when they were bought together. So I think we have some work to do, and I can I can uh, understand why Shawnigan and Cobble Hill uh, have had the same difficulties that North Oyster has, and uh, certainly it's going to be a really difficult uh, uh, buy-in from the public from my area. So we really need to do some, if you really are serious about this, you're going to have to make a $35 annual fee stretch a long way. So, thank you. Director Marsh. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of questions um, through you to our presenter. <coughs> um, the first one was the wood waste and construction mm. waste. What happens to it now when you take it finally, when it gets to its place? Where does it go after that? Mm, that's a good question. It depends on what type of wood waste, right? There's clean wood and then there's other wood that's got the paint. Um, I'll let Sathif, do you want to speak to that? Through the Madam Chair, thank you for the question. Um, so right now, so uh, in the recent past when the, when, the, uh, when the rules were regularly followed by the Ministry of Environment, that, is, that was about the air quality. Um, uh, the things were changed that we, you cannot process the, uh, the wood, waste, wood waste that has um, a painted or, or otherwise processed. Uh, so all of that wood right now is going to garbage. So it comes to, for example, Bings Creek, so we segregate the, the clean wood versus contaminated wood, and contaminated wood, unfortunately, goes to the landfill. We are looking for the markets at this moment, okay. uh, but we haven't found yet. If I, if I may up. follow up on that. And I rem I'm trying, I'm racking my brain, brain to remember, I'm hoping Mr. Carruthers will remember. A few years ago we, we went to um, the hotel and we had the foresters talking about this new composite lumber. The bits of, this, they're not, is that kind of, um, you know what I'm talking about, Susie? No. No, not MDF. They were actually smaller bits put together to make what looks mm -hmm. like two by fours and they're making, so would not that industry be interested in some of this? And, and thanks for the question again. I think the one of the one of the whole idea about this waste management plan, and I think what you will see within is once you have um, very aggressive targets as as to reach to 250 kilograms and, and eventually 150, uh, we will need to look into all markets that they are available. So we will be looking into markets. One of the thing that we want to do, um, <coughs> and it's part of the uh, part of the plan as well, is to go through. Uh, Bing Creek current operation process how we do it and how to make it more efficient in terms of what do we need to make it more efficient how can we find more markets 
within mm -hmm. and, and how we can segregate materials better way to make it more efficient per ton. Okay, and then my other question, um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your last name. It's okay, Tamara Shulman. Ms. Shulman, I think I heard you say that to deliver this plan, it, it's not necessarily just going to be done by, it doesn't have to be necessarily done by government employees, it could be private companies. Correct, the intent of the plan is to, or sorry, did you have more? Well, I, I guess what I'm hearing is the intent is of the plan is to have people divert their waste in the correct way and get us to zero waste. We're not saying that we're gonna necessarily shut down private companies or anything to do that, is that correct? Correct, the plan speaks to what needs to be done. Right. The Thank how you. it happens part does need to involve more consultation and, um, and, and be further explored in an implementation piece. Right. This is about setting direction. <clears throat> so if I could just use the example of the people at Seanigan then is it possible that they could have what they have now only hopefully less of a, a rate of contamination and with a private company? Is that a possibility? Right, and it would actually help to increase participation overall because the subscription service that's implemented um, at present doesn't include everyone, right? It opts in for the, it's, it's opt in for the folks that, that want to use it. Um, right. and and that's where, as this decision-making pro process goes forward, um, it does need to be done in compliance with the CVRD's procurement practices, right? You can't just say, okay, here. Of it has course. to go through a process so that you've got that, um, that value built in and you make sure that it's an appropriate process. That said, if it were to go private, there's different ways that it, potential partnerships or other things could happen. I don't want to be overly prescriptive down that road, but um, you know there there are challenges as well. But that would need to get sorted in in that next pro right. part of the process. So if I just may give the overview of why I, what I understand, we've worked with the the PAC, which are uh, members of the community from the, across the region, in order to come to comply with what we're being asked to do by senior government, and it's not set in stone who's going to do all of that but this is the thing we're required to do is go forward with a solid waste <coughs> management plan. Yeah, um, correct. Thank and that, you. And yeah. Yeah, go um, ahead, Chisi. Madam Chair, with your permission. So just to clarify, and, and you're, you're on the right page there. So this uh, plan strategy talks about the universal or not universal. Universal, as you know, half the population living in municipal areas is already doing that. Um, other communities half the population or portion of the population is or already on recycling um, plan. Uh, trucks are already going to those, those homes to, do, to pick up recycling. Um, some are um, engaged with, with garbage, some not. And then the organic is the major portion as Tamara has, has, has spoken about within the presentation. So going back to your question again, so if that happens, depending on the approval, the next step would be to go in and, and do a um, uh, analysis on what would work best as an efficiency point of view, what would be the service model that could be? And, and I can give you some of the examples. So we heard about the, um, you know, some are the uh, vacationers, secondary homes, and, and all of those things. Just looking at it, would a monthly service would, would do it? Would a bi-weekly service do it? You know, so all of these scenarios to look into. Then also looking into varied service in terms of um, do we need um, you know, the bigger totes, you know, 300 and something liters as compared to 200 something, as compared to 100 something. Um, you know, just like you hear, you know, some people produce more, uh, more garbage than the others. Mm -hmm. So the next step, when you do the next step, the second one, the service delivery model, so we will come back and present it at CVRD to the board and say this is the service mod delivery model looking at it. Then the next step following that would be then, you know, if that is, what options do we have? Public, private, all options. Excellent, thank you for clarifying. Director Davis. Thank you and thank you for the presentation. Um, as usual, it's the responsible people <coughs> that end up shouldering the burden for everybody. And uh, I was just wondering it just seems to be one aspect of one of the 13 recommendations that is largely being objected to. So what costs would be incurred if the contamination can't be brought down from 15 to 3%? So like Recycle BC, 
have, we've had the wake up call already that they, they really don't like that. So what are the risks with that? Yeah, that's a good question. And there are fines associated if they work with a community over a period of time and can't get those down. You've got the specific numbers? Yes. Yes. And who would pay, I guess? Through to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for the question. An important one for what we're dealing with. Um, we were on the table with uh, Recycle BC just recently as, as part of last week um, and, and discussing uh, exactly that. Uh, one that obviously they are concerned about the, the contamination levels. And again, I can confirm on the verbal level again that you know, Recycle BC mentioned that you know, had they known that there is no mandatory garbage pickup service in the area, it'd be, it would have been a difficult situation in terms of signing on, on to that contract. The second portion was to, if, it's, if it remains 15% or more, um, when the markets are changing on the other side of it, again, for everybody's understanding, this is about the commodities when people are selling those items to different markets and, and making money. If it's more contaminated, that means they cannot sell it. That's one thing. But then they get fine on the other side of it. So, there's, so that is what they're, they're handling with. On our side of it, it, I can confirm that it's more than six figures. Um, you know, and it's each and every time uh, we go over, and it's it's you know it's per kind of occurrence type of thing. So it's 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 a big ticketed item. If that happens, I think your next question was if that happens and who pays for it. This is the curbside uh, program. So if we were were put forward with the with the fine, um, because this is all for nine electoral areas, because um, municipalities they they have different contracts. They're they're above and beyond CVRD. So our contract with them, so I think all nine electoral areas will, will pay for it, uh, all residents within electoral areas. Follow-up? Thank you. And so if Recycle BC did not renew their contract with us, what would happen? Through to you, Madam Chair. Yes. So I think that's another uh, very important question. So I think um, when in 2014, September 2014, when Recycle BC was, um, was coming into being, at that time, a lot of municipalities and regional districts, they were still asking the question, and some, they, they could not get onto that program. With time, they understood that you know, there are no markets individually to be found. So within time, with that time, they have now got into the waiting list with Recycle BC. So for Recycle BC, it's very easy to, to say to us that you know, you're too much of a troublemaker, your materials are not worth anything, so we're going to take, take you off of the list. What options do we have then? individually find package and paper and printed paper markets individually for the amount of garbage that we produce or recycle we produce, very difficult. Other side of it, it would be to how, to, how to deal with that now because we don't want to throw it into the, into the disposal facility. So hire another private facility who will have a program with Recycle BC, but obviously they will not pay us back. At this moment, you, you have $34 per residence receiving uh, for their utility fees for, for reduction of it at this moment. But if you go into that, I can only assume that they'll actually charge you money to pick up that material. So there'll be, you can just see costs increasing. Director Clement. I just want to be really clear about uh, our next steps here because I've heard about uh, passing this on to the next board. I'm curious to know, does approving this plan mean that we implement it right away? As Director Kerry uh, Davis said, uh, the largest contention is around 3B. And I'm just curious to know, um, I know that the province is mandating us to implement, uh, have this plan, but implementing is different. And I guess my concern is that if we remove 3B, does this preclude us in the event that there's a desire eight years from now to have mandatory garbage collection, does that stop us from doing that? Those two are tied together. Mm -hmm. So just because we approve it today, it doesn't mean that tomorrow we're going to all of a sudden start looking for new haulers, I guess is what I'm wondering. Right. I'll address the first part, um, which is that should it get passed here, it does go to the ministry um, for final approval. Um, they, they've got their checklist and all the things that they're looking for about how solid waste overall is getting managed as well as around the effectiveness the effectiveness of the plan to move towards targets. Um, it, this doesn't mean that it, parts of the plan can still move forward even without that approval. That approval is there in the case that there needs to be money borrowed and, and also to get the final, the final, you know, the final check. There are elements that can continue to, to move forward. But to answer your question specifically, it doesn't mean that next week we're starting 
uh, to go through, we need to have the implementation process set up in a way that works for the community and that involves um, any additional consultation or studies to make sure that um, the service collection model, as Tassif mentioned, um, makes sense and that the process is, is appropriate for, for, the, for the questions at hand. Thank you. And just, just to add on, so we have a, a schedule, a uh, proposed schedule. So one of the, so I, if you're just particularly talking about the, the curbside collection, I think we have it, you know, we'll probably need another, uh, you know, two years or so just to, and, and, and that'll give us some time to do those analysis that we're talking about to go to the next level and third level then, then again would be who to provides. But just for the, uh, to be clear, for those who may not be familiar with the procedure, uh, it's the purview of the board whether or not to implement those steps when that comes. So it may be 2020, but it may come at that time. And we say, no, we're not for mandatory collection. We're still gonna push that back further. Just because it's in the plan doesn't mean we have to do it, correct? Through to you, Madam Chair. So um, I think my understanding is this is a legal document. Uh, once it's approved that we're going in that direction. Now, when, when we say about, the, um, about the, these strategies, and let's say CVRD you know, today approves it all, the next step, as Tamara has mentioned, it, it's gonna go to the Ministry of Environment. So Ministry of Environment can approve as is, or they can put conditions as forth. So at the end of the day, what we'll follow and what would be the implementation would be based on what is approved by the Ministry of Environment, because that is your, that is your legal document. Director Dory. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, the province is saying that you you have to implement this solid waste management plan. Now, the uh, Shawnigan Residents Association have asked to be excluded from the plan. Uh, now, is that possible? Is it a, is it possible to exclude yourself from the plan? And uh, and what would be the process if if you if you tried to do that, through to you, uh, Madam Chair. A difficult question. So, um, can I just step one step back there? So, when the PAC started to look into um, the status of of our waste management currently, and what are the gaps? So, the gaps are where we're not providing service, you know, or varied level of services. So they're, they become very difficult in terms of implementation because you're looking at the, because um, this is obviously a regional plan. So regional plan is tied to the budgets. Regional plan is tied to um, uh, the overall service delivery and overall goals. So if we start changing from this end to the other, we will then have to look at the, you know, so what are the goals and targets that we're trying to trying to achieve and how are they going to be impacted by taking this community out, that community out, and whatnot. Maybe the other ways are, and, and I, I, as I would recommend, um, that looking at the service delivery models and see what delivery models would work at the end of the day. And, and that is to look into the cost of, uh, of how, we, how we deliver that service. One thing, if I, if I may say that, if you look at the, so this, when, the, when we're looking at the plans and plans looking into 10 years, 10 years is a long time, you know, Technology changes. Um, if I can reflect back to our own CVRD learned lessons, I mean, we were throwing everything in, into landfill. We still have that landfill. We're still monitoring that landfill, but at that time, landfill was the way to go. It was, it was an awesome way to go about. This was the cheapest thing in your own, in your own area. But now, um, if the landfill leaks tomorrow, and that's what we have one of the strategies, strategies number 10 is to keep monitoring. If it leaks, we're gonna have to spend millions of dollars and that's gonna be function 520 to address that. We then move into the next gener uh, generation and, and, and then we went into incineration because at that time, incineration was the best technology because the output or the product that was, that was environmentally friendly. Not so, what we found out later on. So at this moment, I, I think, and, and I'm not trying to sell this one at this moment, but I just want your consideration on, into this one. I think the best way to go forward is to reduce, is to recycle, is to look at what we're trying to dispose of before we dispose off. On the other side of it, the Tamara has just mentioned, you know, what would be more feasible? Can we actually, do we, we don't produce enough. 
And, and I think my rule of thumb is 50,000 tons. That's to, and and that, that'll depend on what technologies we're talking about. So we start talking about technologies and, and all of those things. You will need a lot of garbage, a lot of recyclables to, to, to make those feasible. Going back to, because we're just talking about curbside at this moment, curbside costs will not remain the same because at the end of the day, when curbside, when you're picking up garbage, you're disposing off garbage, right? So that disposal of garbage, if the cost is increasing, somebody's paying on the front end as well. Director Dory. Uh, can I rephrase that question? Would the province allow you to exclude a population of eight or 9,000 from your regional district? Would the province ap approve a plan where they didn't have to uh, uh, join in the, with the rest of the regional district? I can I can take a, a little bit of guesswork because I guess we go, we go through the process and we'll find out. But my my understanding it's it's our plan, uh, CVRD's plan. So if we try to take you know just take a few communities out and in, it's it's our decision, and then we can take it to to them. And if there's no, at the end of the day, it's board's board's decision, and they'll look into that. And and if board's okay with this, I think it should be fine. I have I'll to add on to that briefly yes. of. I don't know of a opt-out exemption type situation that I could offer as a direct parallel. I can say in general when we're looking at solid waste issues and we're looking at exemptions, you lose your economy of scale for your level of effort in terms of trying to, and in this case that's related to pursuing the waste reduction goals. And um, you know, it's, again, I understand why you're asking the question. It's, um, but the, the plan is intended to, to meet those bigger picture goals and benefit the community at large when it comes to things like the fines for having contamination in recycling and the rising disposal costs because as Tasif had pointed out through some of his anecdotes, there is no easy solution, there's no way. Even when you have waste to, waste to energy, you still have mass at the end of the day and various issues with the ash of how to deal with it, right? So. Um, so get optimizing waste reduction across the board is, is the really the, the most viable option at the end of the day, not just environmentally, but sustainably, but um, socially and economically. Okay, I have Director Kuhn, Acton, Nicholson, Stone, Day, and Jackson. Director Kuhn. I have two comments. Uh, in the report, in the recommendations, paragraph four, to the best of the knowledge of the board of directors, says there are no objections to the plan that have not been acknowledged or addressed. I don't like that sentence in there. It, to me, that sounds a bit like brainwashing, and I, I would like to, to have that taken out. And secondly, considering that this is our, our last meeting of the existing board, and there have been a number of changes at the board uh, for the, the current, current term. Uh, I'm not prepared at this stage to push this forward. I'd like to push it over into the next board. And I think uh, uh, I would make, I'd like to make a motion to that eff effect, actually. You're making w your motion is to? To defer this to the next board. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any questions on the motion to? Defer this to the next. Re defer this to the next board. Okay, Director Dory. Uh, thank you. Uh, I've sat at the board table for 13 years and gained knowledge about solid waste management and the issues around the board table and the issues with different communities, uh, North Oyster, the uh, Shawnigan, and to have new board members come in after us considering this for. No, almost a year, I think it's uh, not the proper way to go. I think, uh, I think with the new board, they're going to have enough issues on their table to, to do things. Uh, I think uh, that uh, pushing it to the next board is not the proper way to go. Thank you. Director Day. Thank you. I'm going to speak against this motion. You know, I don't know if what um, Director Kuhn is speaking about really really is one of those unsolved issues in the room. The, the sense I get here is that we've got a solid waste management plan trying to accomplish or get near or close to a zero waste goal at some point in my lifetime and maybe yours. 
um, that we should all be working on together, not just as a region, but as a human race, for that matter. So I see no need to stop this and, and leave it for the next board and do the work all over again, because I've experienced that once in my career here at this table, and uh, it just seems like a fruitless effort, when really the goal is what we should be doing as, as stewards of the, of the planet Earth. Sorry, but that's how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. So I sense there's one issue in this room, that is, there is a small disposal company that does great work. And the question I got to ask myself, if we're going to talk about this number 3B, is it? Mm -hmm. That says, adopt the universal curbside collection service across the region. Can that not include small suppliers of a service in corners of the region? Where possibly we can't do it as effectively as they can? Can that not be included in this plan moving forward? <coughs> So, you know, if, if that's the big elephant in the room, I think, and I would hope that the next board, as this gets implemented, can work with that group, that we don't just kick them out the back door. So, you know, I won't be on this board, but I hope that that's a spirit that it can move forward with in, in cooperation, because opting out isn't an option for me. We all need to be in this together, from one end of the island, from one end of the province to the other, from one end of the country to the other. Thank you. Director Marsh. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I also uh, don't support um, referral. I'm satisfied that the community of Shawnigan Lake may be able to get what they want with the present um, person, if that's the most economical and just way to do it. Um, you know, seven years I've sat at local government tables, and, and I think what, and I, I appreciate the gentleman that spoke earlier from Shawnigan as a delegation, understanding how much time and effort goes in. Um, I've had a lot of little verbal updates about this because I have a member of the Environment Committee in North Cowichan that's been on the pack. And she, um, you know, I, I, I really, she has been reporting in, and we've been quite excited at North Cowichan. We've had to have universal curds, you know, pick up for quite some time. Um, it costs us $85 a year to have our garbage and recycling and, and um, organics looked after. And uh, I'm, I just want to say that I'm one of the people who maybe I put out a garbage can every two months and it's never full. And um, I still pay the $85. I'd rather I didn't, but that's what we do when we create a commons. That's what a civilization does. And um, I don't think it's um, leadership to pass on something that we took on and we've worked on and we've pushed along, not pushed, but um, passed along the way at the, at the 11th hour. I don't believe that on this issue, though I'm not contending with our guest, that maybe on some issues he wanted to deal with the province, he felt it was a lame duck thing. But on this issue, this is something that we've done uh, we started in January, as uh, we were told at the beginning of the presentation. We've had updates, uh, I don't remember how many, but several since then. And as a board, we've been right, we've been behind this. And I'm satisfied that if the private company in Shawnigan can do as good or better a job for a good price, that we, it could be a win-win for everybody. So I do not support uh, referring it. Director Clement. Yeah, I don't really see a point in referring it. Uh, 3B is obviously the contentious point, and that's what I was trying to ask in my question, was whether or not uh, we would need to remove that in order to move forward, because it sounds like the sticking point, or if it is left in place, it doesn't mean that we necessarily implement it. Um, other than that point, the rest of the plan seems to be, people seem to be on board with it and fine, and we can take our time implementing that. And that'll be the board's, the future board, if we're talking about the future board, it'll be their decision what to implement and where, because there's going to have to be budgetary requirements for that. So if we're really talking about them, they have the ability to do that. I think a lot of work went into this. It's great. And uh, I think it'll be our job to, to do that. So I'm against the referral. I'd just rather get over to point four, as Director Kuhn said, is that's what they're asking, is making sure that we're all on board with this and it's all OK. So let's finish this. and and passed it, so I'm against the referral. Director Acton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I'll be supporting the referral, but based not based on the fact of this plan. I'm not even disputing the plan right now. The public has been here. They've said we're not feeling heard. Number one priority of this board was to have community engagement. People have come to us and said, we're not feeling heard. We want to discuss this more. And I can understand why they're saying that. A lot of the industry language was used in the survey, which was not is not the way to get public consultation. The consultation in Cobble Hill had more than a couple hundred people there. Obviously, the people care, and they want to be heard. They're still not feeling heard. There's been certain input has been excluded. I've received 173 emails by the cutoff date of September 14th, I believe it was, and our board chair was also CC'd on them. He's not even here. Since then, I've had 84 emails. Legislative services told me that that number would also be included in this, and it, and it has not been. So I'm really concerned about, again, the community feeling uh, misrepresented and unheard. So the community is asking, we want to hear more. I totally disagree that this board will not be, able, or the new board will not be able to understand solid waste. We could defer it for three months, give some more consultation to the South. They're asking for it. This is our role as local government. I was elected to be the voice of my community. My personal feelings about this plan has nothing to do with it. The community is saying, we're not feeling heard, we want to be heard, and we want to know more. I think they deserve that from us. What kind of legacy do we want to leave, even if we're on our way out? Director Davis. Thank you. I totally agree with Directors Day and Marsh that this is not something that, it's, it's an implementation that's the big issue around here. So it's something for the next board to decide anyway. And the longer this gets delayed, the longer, it, the harder it's going to be to try to catch up and try to reduce the contamination. And also this is, it's been 12 years since the plan, the last, the last amendment was done. So this has been delayed another mm -hmm. two years already. And I think that the next board will, will take a lot more than three months to to wrap their heads around the whole thing. So I'm voting against this. Uh, Director Jackson. Um, I will be voting against it too, um, but can I just ask a yes or no question? I know it's completely out of order. Can PAN do the work? Not, Would, uh, I know it's out of order, but, but it's yes not or no. something that's not something that's yeah. in, that's going to be discussed later. This is the overall about diversion and zero waste. Yeah, I, we can't yeah. in CBRD. We can't say a company can do. Okay, like can, that's just not a what company, we do. A company, potentially. Potentially. Okay, a, a private company. A private company. Can I also, Madam Chair, with your permission? So uh, I, I'm not sure if we can talk about you know. Um, Mentioning one company or, or mm -hmm. favoring one company, yeah. So I, I I'm not sure if we can if we can favor one or the other, but you know, for the, for this question, yes or no about, is it part of the this question today? And it's not. Who is not a question in today's agenda? So the who and how is too early in this, Director Stone. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I, I will say that I understand the desire to support local business. Um, I heard it directly from the people at Pan Disposal um, that they were concerned that if it did go to tender that they may not be able to compete on the economics. Um, their systems are different. They don't have the automated trucks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, bin styles, a lot of concerns around their ability to be able to effectively um, to effectively bid on a contract for a mandatory disposal like that. Um, the, the same thing I can hear from Sean again, and we've seen it time and again, Sean again always has said they want to stand up and do what's right for the environment. I think it was made blatant, clearly obvious during the, the challenge with contaminated soils, and that issue goes on till today. So there's no no um, perception in my mind that, they, that the people of Sean again and areas B, C, and A, and D um, want to, including those in the north, want to do the right thing. 
Um, I just, because I took so many notes, if I can get a little latitude, I just kind of want to review some of my observations. Um, in the reports, in the consultation report, those letters, somebody said when they came to the thing, weren't included. I read more than a hundred pages of letters from residents in the order, ma mass majority being from area B, and then C, and then A, and then D. <clears throat> So we have all seen these, They're, they are part of our package, the some 700 pages that were included in this report, um, a detailed consultation report that went everything through all the slide decks that were provided, um, all the engagements that were provided that were highlighted in, in the presentation. But at the same time, we're hearing from people that that wasn't enough. Um, not to draw a parallel, but we went through a lengthy process within our municipality not long ago, um, had what was termed at the time one of the greatest engagement processes that was out there. Um, we won an award for that engagement process from the Planners Institute of BC, and then we're told by the residents that didn't like the outcome that they didn't feel that, feel that they were heard. So we understand those challenges. Um, there has to be, I think, some time um, line to allow the private hauler working with the community to achieve the targets. So I guess the question that I have through to staff is, Within the context of this moving to mandatory, and we know that in the electoral areas um, where there isn't mandatory collection, um, that the contamination rates are too high, is there a, an opportunity to say, um, without going to mandatory, that if your community can meet the targets that are required, and again, these are required by other levels of government higher than we, um, that there might be an opportunity to not implement that piece as, doctor, uh, as director, doctor, director Clement said. So is there an opportunity to find other innovative ways working with the community and their private hauler to achieve the targets and not having to institute the mandatory collection? So I guess that's my question through to staff. And as it relates to contamination, that is one of multiple issues, right? Mm -hmm. That addresses just the recycling and not the waste reduction. So all of the targets that are, ta are hit right. there. Yeah, there's not a precedent that I know of that allows that to happen. Without um, right, mandatory. and again, it's what we've seen in an evidence-based way in several different types of communities that have urban, suburban, rural, is that when you implement these series of initiatives, you get those desired results related to waste reduction. Okay. And ultimately, those there, there have been some programs, in particular related to recycling and getting the app and working on that, to work on that issue. And because you don't have those containers out and grouped, people, that's, you know, it's human nature to not necessarily hit the right containers, right? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so just a, f a couple quick follow-ups. Do we have a, a number um, that we can just, to, so that it's part of the public record here, the cost per household based on the plan for that mandatory collection in the areas that are not per currently receiving mandatory collection? Through to you, Madam Chair, so uh, another good question. So I think that will really depend on the second level when we go through the service delivery model. Um, you know, it, it'll be times of pickup per month and whatnot. We have looked into um, uh, other jurisdiction when they're, when they're picking up all three, and uh, even though we try to you know, find out something from our, our own municipalities as well, but you're looking at somewhere between you know, the $220 to $300 kind of a range, but you know, they're all different settings and whatnot. But can we look into more efficiencies? Absolutely, we can. Thank you, and um just one more thing I had on all of these pages, but, um, and finally, what, you know, beyond the fact that it, you would be pushing the, the final decision off to the new board, um, are there any other implications of further engagement? Is there, is there uh, an overdue request from the senior levels of government for this plan to be adopted and submitted to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change? Um, as was pointed out prior, it is already two years over as it relates to the requirement to have that 10-year update. Thank you. That's all, thank you. Okay, Director Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in regards to the, uh, the resolution on the floor, I, I, a couple of comments. Uh, the, when, when staff brought this forward, there were a couple of options that were made available to us. There was uh, the option that we have here, which includes a timeline that would put the plan before this board. And that's what we have. There was also an option that this could have been a lengthier plan that was more drawn out, 
that would have uh, would have leapt over the, this term and gone into the next term. And this, por this board gave direction to the staff to proceed with the assumption that th this board would take the responsibility of, of passing this uh, or considering this, this amendment. Uh, so we chose the timeline. Uh, we chose to take responsibility for this amendment. And, and this decision is before us. But, and, and I also, I'm one of the, the steering committee that, that has worked on behalf of the board and, and the communities. And, and I want to stop for a second and just acknowledge the work that the PAC did on this. Because, you know, they dove deep. They, they considered this. And, and we asked them to come back with a, an amendment to a regional plan. And I think they did fantastic work. And I think that it would be a little disingenuous for us to say that, nope, we're going to back away from the commitment that we made to consider this with this board and, and go into another round, whether it be consultation or other considerations. So I, I think that this is urgent that we address this. I won't support referring it to the next board because I think we should do what we said we were going to do. And, and I think there is some urgency in that. I, I just asked Mr. Kieber about the, the fact that our MMBC funding, our recycled BC funding, we've got the warning letters. We've, our contamination rate's too high. We have to approve a plan and get to work on it. Maybe not the parts that, that are of major concern, but we have to get to work because there's you know, almost a half a million dollars at risk if we're not able to continue with the recycled BC. So I'm not going to support this, and I've got some comments that maybe when we get to the, the main resolution. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call the question on the motion on the floor to defer to the next board. All in favor? Opposed? Motion has been defeated. Are we looking for... The other motion, or is there, what's the? Okay, well, it's, um, there it is. It's on the, it's actually in front of you on your sheet, though, okay. as well. Right. It is in front of you. No, you don't have to. It's, it's there, and it's been read a few times. Okay. So it's been moved been seconded, uh, Director Davis. And I did have, just a sec, I had a speaker's list going back to that. Do we want to carry on on the speaker's list with that from before? Okay. So we will start again. Director Stone. Um, just if this is adopted um, as the resolutions, um, is there a way to um, put forward a further motion to continue ongoing engagement with the with the electoral area residents I hear it from um, the north and the south end residents that they're concerned about the implementation of 3b so I was trying to write a quick resolution here but just through to staff do you, would it would it not be appropriate if this is adopted to um, put forward a, a resolution that would ask to and continue to engage further on the implementation of item 3b with the residents in the electoral areas because I think that it's important you know, I think that I just saw, based on the votes that went against the, the previous uh, deferral motion, um, but I also hear from those people that the, the concerns of the residents in the electoral areas are important. So um, would it be out of order after we call this question to put forward another motion to, to direct staff, or not sorry, that's a Lady Smith term, but to work with staff and uh, the directors in the electoral areas to continue that engagement? I'm sure that's... Just one thing to chime in on. It is in the plan. It, it does say in 3B that ongoing consultation is inherent sh should this get passed and go forward. So it's actually built in already. So it's already there. Is it part of the resolutions? I know it's I know it's in the plan, but I think that sometimes if it stands on its own, it makes people have a greater comfort level that we've made a specific resolution. So um, I don't see anybody shaking their heads. So um, I'll keep working on this. Thank you. Okay, so we have this resolution on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. I do not have any other speakers. I'm going to call the question. Yes, this is the main motion. This, yeah. 
So we've just had that moved in. So, okay, Director Acton. I would like number four um, described because as we've heard, the public is not feeling like their comments are being addressed and now we're agreeing that in a legal document that we've addressed all their comments. But what I understood, it's already embedded that we would continue with the exploration of community consultation. So it's already there. We're agreeing. It says, number four, to the best knowledge board of directors, there's no objections to the plan, but we've, we've had a lot of objections. So, mm -hmm. okay. and they're not, and people are not feeling like they're Mr. being. Mr. Crothers, and then Director Marsh. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'll try and add some clarity. Number four is to suggest that there are no objections that have not been previously disclosed. You have, we have certainly heard the objections of people that are, have been opposed to the plan um, and they have been addressed through bringing them forward to the board. Uh, people may not be happy with how they've been addressed, but they have been acknowledged and they've been addressed. The intent of this is that if somebody was to put their hand up and say there's something, some objections that have not been previously disclosed, the board has not had a chance to consider, you've had all of the objections in front of you, they've been disclosed, they may not have been addressed to the satisfaction of all people, but they have certainly been acknowledged and they have been addressed in the plan. That's the intent of number four. Seeing no other hands up, oh, Director Nicholson. Is number four necessary? Mr. Crothers? Oh, Chasif. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, you know, the resolutions are basically uh, at the end of the day when, if it's approved, then we'll have to go through the checklist, we'll have to go through the paperwork, that's the guidan guidan guidance from the ministry. So we will need those resolutions um, for the corporate secretary to, to sign it at the end of the day, what's gonna go to the ministry. So basically all it's, it's saying is, on the checklist that, that have we done all of these steps that are, that are in, the, um, in, in the guideline for the ministry, and, and the staff is um, recommending that we have gone through the process and it's been complete. So that's just saying that we have done the steps and that's part of the process. Yes. Director so staff. Kuhn. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much against this uh, paragraph four. I've never seen it in any other uh, recommended resolution to a board uh, that the board acknowledges that issues have been addressed. We really don't have that detailed knowledge as a board. I mean, staff might have that knowledge, but I cannot sign up for something that staff did. Uh, I would have to have been there all the time. I mean, this, as far as I'm concerned, that paragraph should be deleted. But we were given all the information came through us, so that's what they're saying there, like all of the information, 177 whatever letters and that, that's, that is what this is saying. So, Seif. Thank you again. If it gives any more clarity that uh, the CBRD board chose to have a oversight committee uh, on behalf of the CVRD who will be involved throughout the process. So CVRD Oversight Committee is here um, and they have gone through the process in terms of, and we have reported back in terms of the process, in terms of the public consultation. So it's the reporting back on the public consultation. Director Stone. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm comfortable that I've heard the objections. Um, you know, and, and I just have to reiterate, I think at the high level, I, th I don't think there's any disagreement that we want to achieve the results that we need to achieve for our planet, for our communities. Um, I think the challenge is around the the letters that we've received, the the emails that we've received, and I and I support those positions. And I think that we have to see if there's any creative ways we can kind of build that bridge. Um, but I'm I, I don't have a discomfort in saying that I'm not aware of those objections. So. Um, we've also heard about some of the potential unintended consequences when you move from incinerators to was, is waste to energy another folly in that same direction. So there's a lot of technical reasons that we need to, to consider the, the potential unintended consequences. And I also think we've heard, you know, a strong community feedback against some of the issues here. Um, and that's why I suggested that, that other resolution to make sure that we further consider that. Thanks. Thank you. I have Director Morrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I David. would be supporting
supportive of uh, the uh, subsequent resolution that uh, Director Stone is working on, and I was going to ask you to put the question. Call the question. I have one more speaker, and then I'll call the question. Director I'm Davis. I just wanted to make a quick point. Thank you. I've been a PAN customer for 12 years, and I buy the tickets, and I put out one can and one thing of compost every month or two, so I completely understand where all the, uh, about all the, the letters, but uh, I have also talked to one of the, the people who was on the pack from the public, and I've been certainly satisfied that this is the right way forward. Okay, I will now call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on now to a, sorry? Oh, right, follow up. So, Director Stone. Um, <coughs> Madam Chair, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll send this through to you if it's appropriate, maybe we need to clean it up a little bit, um, but I would move that the board and staff engage electoral areas in further consultation around solid waste management plan amendment four strategy 3B to ensure that all community concerns are considered prior to implementation. So that's been moved and seconded. Director Acton. I, I, I don't know if that's just a little bit, um, like h how is that consult consulting them now? Because we're consulting on the implementation on of the strategy implementation, 3B. But it's not about. Well, we can just let it go and we can just move forward with the plan. You're welcome to defeat it. Director Marsh. Yeah, I, um, I can feel the disappointment in Director Acton, and um, I'm satisfied that going forward that there will be more consultation with the people who have concerns. I, we don't know what the outcome will be. We know that I, potentially a private operator could do some of this, but under the Government Act, we would have to go out to an RFP. We can't just give it to someone. We, we really don't have that ability to do that. So um, I, I support the, the motion, but I just wanted to just make a little plug. Um, there is on the CBDRD website something called Notify Me, and all of your, you can spread to all of your people, and I'm sure your director has let you know, so that when there's any particular item coming up, you'll get notified right in your inbox. And, and I really respect that people don't feel consulted but I also understand and watch and have worked with staff and it's been mentioned to you that we had a 700 page agenda for today's meeting. That's not entirely unusual. Sometimes they're only 400. So it's not, I think it needs, I agree with the idea that communication, it is a two way thing. And somehow we need the, the public to make sure that they're assertive and get signed up for the notifications so they get early, early notified because the business does have to carry forward. This is two years past when we ought to have tabled it. We've just had an IPCC report that's, well, sobering is not a big enough word. And I think that it, it behooves people to move forward as quickly as we can to do our part so that we can adapt and, and survive what's coming with all the climate change. And, and it's just not acceptable that a community that's been the leader on the environment as a CBRD has to be bumped out of recycling because of a high level of contamination. That's just, just not acceptable. So, thank you. So, an extra motion on consultation. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion has carried. I'd like to suggest a five minute recess. Yes, yes, that was gonna be, I, yeah, five minute recess.
Yes. Yeah, no. Moving, are you okay? Uh, moving on now to R2. Yes, Madam Chair. R2, a report from the Parks and Trails Planner regarding the 2019 Community Resilience C Investment Program for Fire Smart Community Grant Funding. And there's a recommendation there that an application be submit, uh, submitted to the ministry for this program for a $100,000 grant to fund development of fuel management prescriptions and complete fuel management treat treatments as outlined in the Parks and Trails Division Staff Report dated October 16, 2018. It's been moved. I move. Is there a seconder? Any questions for Tanya? Director Morrison. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just looking at the list, and I, and I acknowledge that it says that you can, uh, you can add uh, communities and parks later, but I'm, I'm, I'm just a little concerned that you know our, my colleague across the the way from me uh, has you know a, a substantial number of community parks in in his uh, electoral area, and, and it seems to be uh, very concentrated uh, in in the southern part of our our uh, region, you know, except for Couch and Valley Trail and the likes. Uh, uh, did you look at other contenders? Do you have a list of the next? round in uh, to be considered for uh, for inclusion in this program welcome Tanya thank you madam chair in the process of deciding which parks because we have an approved uh, community wildlife preparedness plan where the public safety division is also in the process of updating it so they've kind of broken the CBRD down into quadrants so we have received draft copies so far and we've received the central and the south and just today we received the north so i was looking at those as being the new updates and within those they had listed various parks that they were focusing on so that being said um, because we do have the approved wildfire plan that does cover the whole district this was the preliminary <coughs> list that we can put forth for this grant application and then look at further ones in the future Director Morrison. So just as a follow-up to ensure that there's, a, you know, at least a, a, an attempt at, at regional equity, uh, uh, is there a risk if there's uh, that fourth quadrant coming in last that uh, there's uh, uh, the, the funding might uh, not be there for, uh, for those that are later in the program? Or are we assured that there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, at least an attempt at uh, regional equity and inclusion in some of the uh, other areas in, in later funding requests? We can, thank you, Madam Chair, we can look at uh, other parks that are in the area now based on the former uh, plan. And because we're on such a tight deadline to get this application in, we can, I would say, just look at, at future parks. Uh, during the next round. So to answer your question, I would say that at this point we can have a quick look through if there's any significant parks in Area F and Area I uh, that we have flagged as being potential candidates and we can add them. Uh, this first round is most likely going to be field management prescriptions and then with the next round um, we can look at more doing the operational work. Director Nicholson. Thank you. I think um, I'm, I'm very supportive of us um, fire smarting um, our community as much as we can. We've got a lot of work to do on that front. Um, and our parks are obviously a, an important recreational asset and a green viewscape kind of asset. 
but they're also a really important ecological asset. And um, they're, you know, they're, our parks are really important in our area for wildlife habitat and they contribute to the hydrological cycle and erosion control and all those great things, carbon storage. And our ecosystems are under a great deal of stress now with climate change. So you, you all see the red cedars and heard that cedars are probably going to die out in the next 50 years and, and most of the, most of the uh, ecosystems in our area. Um, and I think I think it's really important that we start to think about what we're doing, not in an engineering kind of approach to things, um, but in a much more ecological thinking. So we need to, because the ecosystems are under stress, we won't want to add to that stress by our fire smarting activities. We need to do it sensitively to try and maintain the ecological function and ensure that those ecosystems remain resilient moving forward because they're, they're really, um, suffering. So I guess my concern on this whole thing is that we need to, we need to look carefully and consider a next staff pos position that comes available in either planning, land use planning or parks that has, that we can hire a professional ecologist to help us with these important um, decisions that we're going to be making as we move forward. Um, operational decisions and and I know in this thing it says well a, for, a professional forester has to do the the plans for these and I I can assure you from my background a professional forester rarely has any ecological training that you need to do this properly so I really think we need to get smart about this they're really incredibly important assets to our our region and I think we need to think about hiring uh, qualified staff to help us with this issue Director Stone. So just uh, looking at the list really quickly, so this is prioritized based on the highest risk for wildfire? So, or just because as you said previously that not all of them have had a close look. Like, you know, I, I noticed that Stocking Creek Park is not on here. Um, there's a lot of interface areas along the edges. There's industrial activity, logging on the edges. Um, so I was just wondering if this was prioritized based on risk or just what we've been able to look at and then the risk of what we've been able to look at. Madam Chair, this was based on the draft CWPP plans that were coming forth from the consultant that was hired that had focused for the first few phases on the, the central yeah. and the south. Thank you. So that's where they were. So that it's not saying that Stocking Creek Park and others don't need attention. Next line of exactly. funding. Yes, thank you. Okay. So seeing no other questions, I'm going to call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you, Tanya. Moving on now to R3. A report from the General Manager of Community Services regarding investing in Canada infrastructure program. It is a recommendation that it be recommended to the board that an application be submitted to the community, culture, and recreation opportunity within the investing in Canada infrastructure program for $245,655 for arena technical equipment life cycle replacement at the Island Saving Centre. In the second part, an application be submitted to the community, culture, and recreation opportunity within the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program for $1,551,600 for parking lot improvements at the Cary Park Recreation Centre and Shawnigan Lake Community Centre. It's been moved and seconded. Did questions? No? Okay. Everyone wanted to move and second it. All in favour? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, moving now to R4. And R4 oh, was, an was distributed there. yesterday. Mm -hmm. Everybody seen R4? It's attached to your live gov. No, it was on there yesterday. So there's a recommendation there's which I will read out yep, as soon as ahead. I can call it up. Okay. So this is a report from the Sport Tourism Subcommittee and it's recommended to the board that the following grants be awarded from the $30,000 Sport Tourism Grant Fund. 
There's 11 separate items there with different amounts. It is on your agenda in front of you. It's been moved and second. Any questions, Director Morrison? Uh, just a question, hopefully through you to, I think it might be Mr. Elzinga. Uh, I wanted to ask, I was just reading the, uh, the time frame for applications and if you could just clarify for me perhaps that it, for those uh, qualifying events that would be happening after uh, June 30th, July 1st, that the application uh, time frame is, is still open for next year? Madam Chair, if I may? Yes. Uh, through to Director Morrison, uh, he's entirely correct. Uh, the uh, ongoing application intake periods will be April 1st for the period of July 1st to December 31st and October 1st for the period of January 1st to June 30th. This year being the exception, uh, we allowed for applications from current through to June 30th, and uh, we didn't exclude applications in the last two months of this year. Director Walker. And as a member of that committee, we were quite careful. We considered that, and uh, also we reduced the amounts of many of these, and we were very careful to spend only approximately just over 50% of the $30,000. So there's, we don't know what the next batch of applications will be, but it was given full consideration by the committee. Correct. Call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Is there any unfinished business? No unfinished business. New business. No new business. Question period. Questions shall be addressed to the chair. It must be truly gentlemen, questions and not statements, opinions. opinions. Questioners are not permitted to make a speech. Only because we're really hungry. <laughs> Ma Madam Chair, if I may make a, yes. a point on the last uh, agenda item, and yes. uh, I direct this to, to Mr. Berry. Uh, this being a report from a subcommittee to regional services, does this need to be forwarded to the board for approval this afternoon? Yes. Okay, so it will be. Thank you. Hello. Seventy-three percent of the garbage collected in the CVRD is from non-households. So my question is, why isn't there a huge focus on this non-household garbage? There are far fewer uh, non-households than households. You, one should be able to easily obtain the target of 250 kilograms per capita simply with a focus on non-households. Thank you. I think they spoke to that as well. That was the commercial IC, ICI. So I agree with that because in the village, like some places, lots of garbage. Madam Chair, I'm Cliff Evans from Shawnigan Lake. Madam Chair, will the solid waste be going to board this afternoon? Yes. It will be going. Is, yes. is this not a little bit rushed, Mrs. Madam Chair? I don't believe so. Madam Chair, uh, some of the, the, or one thing at least, is not correct in the report. And that is on the re report of uh, Shawnigan's dump. And it is reported, and I have the page number on your report, that that Shawnigan dump was supposed to be run by the improvement district, and this is not true history. I chatted with the uh, fire chief, and uh, he's a, also, also a trustee, and he said to their knowledge that they never did run the dump in Shawnigan Lake. So that information, I believe, is incorrect. From my knowledge, and I've been here since 1952, to my knowledge, when they closed the dump, which was um, parallel to the Shawnigan Police Station, when they closed that, that dump was sold to some businessmen, and they remediated that at a cost of over a million dollars. The, the dump they were talking about is at the end of Malta Road and Plumtree, 
and that that was crown land and people just started dump, dumping there the uh, a local gravel company bought that land and wanted to have a, a, a garbage dump there. In fact, they started an illegal garbage dump in there. And the residents of Shawnigan Lake fought that and had that turned down. A second owner bought that, it's called Tower Fence, and just buried everything underneath. That is still sitting in, in Shawnigan Lake in our watershed today. And uh, it was listed, I believe, as a contaminated site uh, registered with the province of BC. Madam Chair, can we have that corrected on that before it's passed? I could look into it, but I'm not, I don't have the history. It's on not the correct dump. information. I will check with staff and get back to you. So it's going to be passed through board this afternoon, and, and you have knowledge that it is incorrect information. Well, I will check with staff and, and clarify that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Moving now, we have no closed session. Motion to adjourn. Oops, oops, sorry, just a sec. Is there somebody else that wishes to speak? Oh, my apologies. I didn't see you, Susan, sorry. That's all right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, once again, we've heard from the public about uh, their concern about timely access to information or information um, being shared with them um, on the uh, agendas as well. Um, there was information today that was not uh, given out ahead of time or maybe it was only given yesterday. And the public in this instance, because the board meeting is in just over an hour, the public doesn't even have an opportunity to review the material um, before it goes to the board for final approval. Um, I've stood and asked many times with the regional services and how the decisions made here are put to the board without time for the public to be considered or to give input. Has there been any movement or discussions within this board or the staff or a combination of both to create a greater timeline from when this information is voted upon and when it receives final approval from the board? No, there has not been. But are you talking about R4 on our agenda? Uh, what, what yes. What are you talking about? Um, and um, there's some, sorry, there was uh, reports that were only verbal reports. So when there's only verbal reports, and I'm not talking just today, I mean there was some examples today, but when there's um, a lot of uh, information that is imparted at these meetings only comes in the form of a verbal report that does not give the public the opportunity to review the video, to listen to what was said before having an, uh, an opportunity to comment on it and let their directors or their board me members know their feelings. Thank you. We'll talk about that at our next agenda meeting. Thank you. I'll now move to, uh, oh, Mr. Evans. Madam Chair, I have a follow-up question. Um, do you think that the public had, all the public in all the electoral areas had a chance for input to the solid waste plan? As a director myself sitting on this board, I made sure that my community was completely aware of it and had a separate community conversation besides all the conversations that were already done in the, in the community with the solid waste. So I separated it out and had a community conversation specifically on that. That's, as a director, is what I did. So I'm, I'm very aware of how much consultation went out and um, I did my part as part of my duty to my residents. Madam Chair, uh, <coughs> in the Shawnigan Lake Cobble Hill area, we had a meeting in the Cobble Hill Hall. All the people couldn't fit in the hall. They, there's so many people um, came out. And we had a gentleman here just a few weeks ago 
complaining that Shawnigan Lake did not have a public meeting. They had it at Cobble Hill and invited Shawnigan Lake, but there wasn't enough room in the hall. So in the future, can we please ensure that all the public are accommodated and if they can't, uh, then maybe the uh, stacking of electoral areas uh, shouldn't be done because we have 8,000 people in, in Shining Lake and uh, Mill Bay has plenty too and Cobble Hill, there could have been three separate uh, public uh, meetings over this, I believe. Thank you, we'll take that into consideration. Are there any other people that wish to speak at the podium? Yes, go ahead, please. I would Question. like to introduce myself to the board as Kim Barnard. I was a member of the Solid, Solid Waste Management PAC, and I represented the concerns of Shawnigan Lake during the entire process. I was also the coordinator for the annual, hopefully annual, cleanup day around the lake that occurred uh, this year on Earth Day. And so I have a vested interest in reducing illegal dumping in my community, as well as educating each and every member, including seasonal residents, what they can do to reduce their disposal rates. And I would like to just say that if the responsibility fell on my shoulders to communicate that to my community, that was never, ever required of me through the PAC process. So the PAC process was a team effort and I do believe that there are gaps in the system when it comes to communication, and I would love to create a new committee based on my uh, experience as a graphic designer and communicator to be able to reach the public more effectively. And so I welcome each and every one's con contributions to that particular problem today. Thank you so much, and thank you for volunteering your time for your community. Moving on now to adjournment. So moved and seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried.